Professor Brian Schmidt, 2011 Nobel Laureate for Physics, NUS Trustee Mr. Han Fu Kuang, Australian Trade Commissioner Ms. Tracy Harris, International Peace Foundation Chairman Mr. Uwe Morovitz, NUS Provost Professor Tan Ing Chai, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the National University of Singapore. I'm Geraldine, a third year student from the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. And I'm Christian, a second year student at Yale NUS College. Together, we will be your MCs for this evening's very special program. To begin, may we invite Professor Tan Eng Chai, NUS Deputy President for Academic Affairs and Provost, to give his welcome address. Professor Tan, please. Professor Brian Smith, 2011 Nobel Laureate for Physics, NUS Trustees, Mr. Hang Fu Kuang, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Very good evening to everyone. On behalf of the National University of Singapore, I would like to bid everyone a warm welcome to our campus. This evening, NUS is honored to host this event, which is part of the International Peace Foundation's ASEAN Bridges Speaker Series. Established under the joint patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize winners. The current ASEAN Bridges Speaker Series continues from four highly successful runs. NUS is delighted to welcome Professor Brian Smith, an acclaimed physicist, who has graciously agreed to give the keynote address today, tonight. Next month, we'll be receiving Dr. Muhammad El Baradi, Nobel Peace Laureate and former Dir Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Bridges Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace is a unique initiative. It is set up to be an international, intercultural, and interdisciplinary platform for creative cultures of learning and continued education. I applaud the International Peace Foundation for their foresight. ASEAN is located in Asia, a dynamic region that is poised to grow in preeminence, economically, politically, and in every field, be it science and technology, academia, or the arts. Asian players are emerging and are becoming significant players in the world. It is thus apt and timely that the Bridges series, which has its conceptual origins in Europe, has now been brought to the ASEAN region. Since the ASEAN Bridges series was incepted in 2003, the work has yielded many highly positive outcomes, spanning, amongst others, academic cooperation, environmental protection, improving health care, and reducing violence. Singapore and NUS shared many common aims with the Bridges speaker series. Here in Singapore, as a small and open economy, we appreciate the importance of building ties and bridges. Indeed, our very own existence, relevance and prosperity is founded on our links with other countries and serving as a hub for shipping, trade and finance. Academic institutions such as NUS are a microcosm of the modern world. Many ties and bridges are forged within and beyond the university. At NUS, one of our key education missions is to develop students to become effective global citizens who are able to thrive and seize opportunities in this globalized and interconnected world. It is thus imperative that our graduates are broadening their horizons developing global mindsets, and honing cross-cultural skills. To sit in our graduates an open and curious mindset, each year, NUS sends more than 2,000 students for a semester exchange program at one of our 300 partner universities spread over 40 countries. Simultaneously, we welcome about 1,800 students from our partner universities to spend a semester at our campus. Their presence enhances the diversity, vibrancy, 
and learning opportunities at our campus. Faculty members and students in turn have the opportunity to forge relationships and build bridges with others from across the world. Yale and U.S. College is uh, one recent model of educational innovation at NUS, which is another fine example of scaling new heights through building bridges across borders. NUS has partnered Yale University, one of the world's trailblazers in liberal arts education, to establish the Yale and U.S. College, or YNC. YNC will offer a unique and distinctive curriculum spanning Asia and the West, the arts and sciences, the first of its kind in Asia. YNC aims to redefine liberal arts and science education to prepare graduates for a complex, interconnected world. As part of its education, students will be exposed to the diverse intellectual traditions and cultures of Asia and the world. Today's dialogue, conducted in the shared spirit of openness and edification, presents yet another opportunity for us to forge deeper mutual understanding, respect, and to seed collaborations. For without dialogue, diversity can often be divisive and differentiating. Dialogue helps us to overcome the initial barriers and to uncover the richness in diversity. And the university is conducive grounds to bridging diversity as we seek to advance common aims in education, research, knowledge creation, and discovery. The topic which Professor Schmidt is speaking on strikes a deep chord with me. Indeed, science, like music or the fine arts, is a beautiful, universal language that transcends culture, geography, or religion. But what is fascinating about science is about how advances in theoretical boundaries can translate into applications that impact lives and society in a very tangible way. As scientists, we are often passionate about our individual research fields, but we must also realize that we are all part of something greater. It is constructive to consider science its history, directions, and impact in a broader way. The collective advancement of science has been pretty amazing. Thus, I look forward to hearing Professor Smith's take on how science is humanity's universal bridge and how the role of science has and will shape society and in turn be a basis for peace and development. I'm sure participants here will be enriched and inspired. So on this note, I wish everyone an engaging and enjoyable evening. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tan. We are pleased to now invite Mr. Uwe Moravets, Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, to share his thoughts. Mr. Moravets, please. Yeah, welcome to the fifth ASEAN event series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace. Bridges is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political and non-religious foundation under the patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Laureates based in Vienna. The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including some of the major universities in this country, and I would like to thank the National University of Singapore for hosting our event tonight. Having started in October 2014, Bridges will be continuously held until March this year, involving the participation of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics. The fifth ASEAN series of Bridges follows the series of 500 Bridges events, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia, Cambodia, and Vietnam since 2003 as an independent platform for dialogue and the contribution to the Decade for Culture of Peace, 
and nonviolence initiated pro and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly. Bridges has been established as an international, intercultural, and interdisciplinary platform for creative cultures of learning and continued education for all people. The International Peace Foundation has no concept for peace and no fixed solution how to achieve peace, but we believe that the first step towards peace is dialogue and that the basis for peace is education. The International Peace Foundation does not take sides, but acts as a mediator by creating an independent platform for dialogue where people meet who normally don't meet. People from all walks of life, people who speak different languages, even if they speak the same. As politicians speak another language than artists, and business and religious leaders another one than scientists, it is seldom that they speak with each other or even work together. We live in a world where some people pretend to know the answers and solutions, how to solve problems, how to achieve peace, though the quest for peace lies in the art to pose the right questions. The International Peace Foundation believes that the interconnected problems of our world today cannot be solved by either one of these language groups only, only by politicians, only by business, only by scientists, or by religion alone, but by working together. In the Bridges event series, people from all walks of life meet in a multidisciplinary program to find creative solutions to solve problems and to achieve peace. Peace within ourselves, within our families, within social structures, peace with nature and the environment, peace between nations, cultures, and religions. Peace is a process. Dialogue is a process. It is nothing which can be achieved instantly. It needs time. This is why Bridges is not organized as one single conference, but as a series of events over the period of six months in which Nobel laureates built bridges with leaders in all parts of society and with the general public. Peace is not something which can be left to the elite of a few, but which needs the partic participation of everyone. Only if many ways cross and people walking these ways meet, can international understanding be achieved and problems com commonly solved. If we listen to and learn from each other, we may discover that there is not only one way to achieve peace, but that there are many ways, and certainly ways we have never thought of to go. It is my pleasure to invite you today to listen to and share your views with Professor Brian Schmidt, a Nobel laureate for physics, who has kindly agreed to come to Singapore to help build bridges. Thank you also for Dr. Jennifer Gordon. It was a pleasure to have you here as well. The wife of Brian Schmidt, she spoke this afternoon also to students at Yale News. But we now look forward to Professor Brian Schmidt's keynote speech and to his important contribution towards peace. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Moravitz. May we now invite Professor Charles Balin, Dean of Faculty, Yale and U.S. College, to introduce our guest speaker. Professor Balin, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Charles Balin, and I am the Dean of Faculty at Yale and U.S. College. Yale and U.S. is the first fully residential liberal arts college in this part of the world, founded jointly by Yale and the National University of Singapore. It embodies the concept that students benefit by a broad education that includes the arts, humanities, and the social and natural sciences, an education that is carried out both inside and outside the classroom. I'm especially pleased that Yale and U.S. has the opportunity to host Professor Brian Schmidt, whose theme this evening reflects the philosophy and the ethos of our institution. I am myself an astrophysicist, and in the late 1980s, I was a postdoctoral student at Harvard University. I recall discussing with some of my friends the intake of first-year graduate students. They seemed so young and so eager 
to those of us facing the imminent prospect of our 30th birthday. Among the bright-eyed first years was a young man uh, recently graduated, I believe, from the University of Arizona, uh, named Brian Schmidt. Brian chose to pursue the study of supernovae under the direction of Professor Bob Kirshner, and I recall that some of us were a bit bemused by this choice. Supernovae are giant explosions, messy, complicated affairs, spewing out a wide range of radiation, particles, and gases, and it wasn't clear that parsing the details of these things would lead to deep understanding. Supernova seemed to some of us to be, in Shakespeare's words, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. But in fact, as things turned out, they revealed the fate of the entire universe. As Brian explained to some of us earlier today, he followed his passion. And over the course of the subsequent decade, some of the characteristics of the various categories of supernovae became clear. In particular, astronomers found that the luminosity of some classes of supernovae could be accurately determined. And thus, the distances to these very energetic objects could be established. This allowed supernovae to be used as markers for the geometry and evolution of the universe as a whole. By following these signposts, Brian, together with his collaborators and competitors, made one of the most remarkable scientific discoveries of the past generation. He found that the universe is suffused with an unknown source of energy, dark energy, as it was quickly dubbed, that more than suffices to counteract the gravity of all the matter in the universe combined and causes the expansion of the universe to accelerate. It's a truly cosmic discovery. All of the matter and energy with which we are familiar uh, turn out to be only a tiny fraction of the mass energy of the universe, with the vast majority in a form that we still know very little about. It's a discovery that expanded our conception of the universe we live in well beyond anything that had been imagined. And yet, like all scientific discoveries, this discovery was made by people by human beings, and thus it is entirely appropriate that Professor Schmidt should take as his topic for this evening, Science, Humanity's Universal Bridge. Thank you, Charles. It's great to see you after all these years. When I was a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed first-year uh, graduate student, uh, Charles worked on an area very similar to me, and it's great to see our uh, paths cross again in uh, this hemisphere uh, rather than the one we started in. It's a great place to make the trip to Australia to this time zone, which is very close to my own, which is useful because normally when I try time zones. And so Singapore is... Uh, a close relative to us in Australia, and as I said, it's great to, I guess, share some of my thoughts here about science and its role in humanity. Yes, hopefully. All right. Science and its role, we think astronomy. Do we, this coming in and out? I think we should do some technical rearrangement before we go too far, and I come in and out. So if someone would like to help me, I would appreciate it. Yep. Yeah, I may move to that if it's not. Just, okay. Hello? Good? All right. So I'm going to look like Britney Spears, but I'll sound <clears throat> like someone with a deeper voice. All right. So astronomy has been with humanity since the dawning of our species. When you go through and you look at the sky, if you go to the Atacama Desert in Chile, one of the most amazing sites on planet Earth, this is what it might look like. It doesn't necessarily look like this, unfortunately, in Singapore tonight. But let's look at one of the objects up in the corner. 
This is known as the Pleiades star cluster. It's made up of thousands of stars. It's about 200 million years old. And this cluster has been around and visible by essentially every human who has ever lived on planet Earth because it's visible from both the northern and southern hemisphere. And it's being 200 million years old and the human race only 100,000 years old. It has been seen throughout our humanity. And it's been recorded by humanity and different cultures in a variety of ways. It turns out that, for example, the Greeks give it the name that most of us in the Western world know, which is the Seven Sisters. But quite remarkably, the Australian Aboriginals, who have been isolated from the other uh, people of the world for tens of thousands of years, also give it the same name, the Seven Sisters. If you go to ancient India, it's known as the Seven Virgins. Various parts of Africa, it's given the name of Seven Women. In Thailand, where we just were, it's talked about as the chicks, but there are seven of them. There is a reoccurring theme. Seven females are represented by these stars. And that is a story that seems to be throughout humanity. And what's remarkable is when you look at the Pleiades with your own eyes, as depicted, for example, by a vehicle that I happen to own, a Subaru, there are six stars that you can see with your eyes, not seven. And that's because your eye is not the Hubble Space Telescope. And so your eye can only pick up the bright and faint things. So those seven stars to your eye, rather than looking like this, are going to blend together based on the poor sensitivity of your eye to look something like that. So the fact that, for example, the Japanese call it something other than the seven sisters tells you it's not a universal story, but it is one that permeates all of humanity. It is a story that seems to be shared and goes back to the prehistoric days and it has been handed down through the generations that we all share. So I find it quite remarkable. We have one of the oldest things that you can trace of humanity are stars. It's not surprising when you think about it, but it tells you the role and we actually have proof of this. If we go and we look at some of the oldest human artifacts that depict things, for example, in a cave in France, this image is 17,300 years old and it shows a bowl, but it also shows six stars. And Interestingly enough, what is the bowl in the sky? It's Taurus. And where are the Pleiades? Pleiades, Taurus the bowl. This is a picture of the sky from 17,300 years ago. And we still call it Taurus. And we still see the seven sisters there. So astronomy and our thinking of the skies go back to everyone and it's something Everyone and every human shares together. Now, let's move forward to the Greeks and start thinking about the development of science, not just looking at the stars, but understanding them. So it was very important in the old days to be able to predict for various political and religious re uh, reasons where the planets would move across the skies. And we knew of the planets but you wanted to know where they're going to be in the future so you could predict things. For example, now it was used for Easter. And the person who developed a great system to do this was an astronomer or philosopher named Ptolemy. And to do this, he didn't have a free hand. And that's because to he, he had some rules he had to follow. And those rules are axioms of the day and one of which was that the Earth is the center of the universe. 
Now, you could challenge that assertion back in his day, but it may cause you to have to drink poisonous substances or do something else. So it was not a wise move. The other axiom he had is that things move on circles. Why did the Greeks adopt those? I have no idea. They were aesthetically pleasing, I guess. But quite remarkably, using those two axioms, he was able to come up with a way of describing the motion of the planets that was very accurate. It was almost as accurate as the observations you could make of the day. And it used this funny way of having circles within circles within circles, which we now call epicycles, a way of describing, in many respects, a poor theory. But this was a very powerful one, and it was used by the, uh, essentially all of the world, or at least all of the Western world, to predict the motions of the planets for thousands of years. It really wasn't until you got to the time of Nicholas Copernicus that people started thinking otherwise. And so Nicholas Copernicus in the 15th century had an idea, and that idea was let's break one of the rules. Let's not have the earth be the center. What happens if I allow the sun to be the center? Then, of course, you have this beautiful, complex spirograph become this elegantly simple concentric sets of circles. But why did we eventually accept this? It had nothing to do with Copernicus, because this was an idea. But there was no reason to believe it was true, because it turns out his model was not nearly as good at predicting where the planets were going to be compared to Ptolemy's. He just had circles all going around one thing. And it turns out, he didn't know this, but they actually go in ellipses, as I will show you that Newton figured out. But this model is different than Ptolemy's because it makes some other predictions. And those were figured out by Galileo, who had the fortune of improving the telescope so that you could go out and you could start looking at things like the planets. And when Galileo looked at Jupiter, it didn't look like a star that moved around the sky. It looked something like this. It was an orb that was surrounded by four other orbs that orbited it. Very clearly, the Earth was not the center of that system. But even more importantly, he looked at Venus. And when he saw Venus, he realized that it absolutely showed that Copernicus was right. Because when Venus came to the near side of the sun, then only a tiny bit of it would be uh, illuminated. And it would appear big because it was close. And it was on the far side of the sun, everything would be illuminated. And it would appear small because it's a long ways away. So it was the observations with the telescope that showed that Copernicus, Copernicus's idea was correct. Now Galileo knew the power of convincing people, and so he was famous for giving his friends, and it turned out eventual enemies, telescopes, so they could see with their own eyes what he saw. And he was obsessed with convincing people that Copernicus was right, that the Earth was not the center. And that turned out to not necessarily have been his best political move at the time. It turns out the world was not quite ready for him to tell them and even demonstrate to them that the Earth was not at the center. And so he was sentenced to life in a Tuscan villa, which if you're ever in Arquetri, in Florence, you can see it's about six bedrooms. It's pretty nice, actually. Probably about five to ten million dollars worth of real estate now. Uh, and so it was a prison for him nonetheless, but I would say a relatively nice prison. Uh, however, in the process of all of this, Galileo started developing 
the beginnings of what we call the scientific method, where you have an idea and then you test it. And for whatever reason, the Greeks never really developed that idea. Is you had axioms and you stuck by them. And this was a change, a major change, for the way that we view the universe. Now, it was expanded to the real modern form by Newton. Newton was able to take the ideas of Galileo and Kepler and to make a mathematical model which was able to make very precise predictions. The predictions made by Newton and the fact that his model would say that objects should move on ellipses, which Kepler had figured out, was so accurate that it effectively could predict better any of the observations of gravity that were able to be made. And it came up with this idea that we still use today where you're able to model things and to test them with very high accuracy. And the reason you can test them with very high accuracy is because you can predict things with very high accuracy. And that's the fundamental basis of science is prediction. Prediction with accuracy. Now, for a couple hundred years, all seemed well. Technology advanced, and we we're able to go out and find the first planets using large telescopes. This is something that William Herschel did. And wandering through the sky, he found the planet Uranus, a star that, or a planet that had evaded detection for uh, the human eye, for uh, all of humanity to this point. And as it moved across the sky, something happened. It was not following the predictions of Newton's law of gravity. So what does that mean? Did that mean that Newton's law of gravity was wrong? Or was something else afoot? Well, it turns out that a French mathematician was able to realize that instead of Newton's law of gravity being wrong, there was a way of fixing it. There was simply a necessary of putting an undiscovered planet at a spe specific place on the sky. That allowed the German astronomer, uh, Galilei, to go out and promptly discover it in a rare form of French and German cooperation in the mid-19th century. But the point being is, what was the state of our knowledge before those observations were made. We didn't know. There was a question. Is gravity right or is there a planet? And it's observation that goes through and tells you what is real and what is not. And so I contend, uh, as I will show you, that that is the basis of how we understand the universe. Now gravity continued to essentially be perfect at predicting what we see until Albert Einstein was thinking, in this case he was thinking about someone falling off a ladder, but we're going to conceptualize it in the way that Galileo thought of gravity. He thought of, you've got a bowling ball, you've got a feather, what happens when you drop them? Well, of course, they fall at exactly the same speed. If you happen to be in a large vacuum tamber, uh, chamber, as this one is in, and, uh, and, and that, that we all accepted. Turns out the Greeks hadn't really thought about this, but uh, Galileo had sort of reasoned through this. But when Einstein looked at that, he thought, I think that no matter when you fall in a gravitational field, the gravity and your acceleration will be exactly counteracted. That must always happen. There must not be any situation where that's not true. Now, it's a kind of a simple thought. Let me express it in a different way. If I put you in a box and you don't have a window, there is no physical experiment you can make that tells you if you're on planet Earth, like we are in this room, being accelerated by 9.8 meters per second squared, or if you're in a rocket ship being accelerated by 9.8 meters per second squared. 
They are exactly equivalent. So from that thought, he was able to go through and work, it turns out, for eight and a half years. It was a hard problem to solve to figure out the consequences. And the consequences were quite remarkable. Space would be curved. Gravity would cause space to be curved. And so if you were to go out and look, for example, at stars during a solar eclipse, as Eddington did at the bottom of the page in 1919, you would expect from his theory that those stars would be in a different place than they would be when the sun was not there. So from pure thought alone, Einstein was able to do something quite remarkable, which turned out when it was confirmed made him a public figure. Einstein was famous within physics circles in 1920, but this is the event that made Einstein famous. Most of the people in this room will know E equals mc squared, but to us physicists, it's the theory of general relativity for which we most respect Einstein because it is one of the only times where an idea came out of really thin air and made predictions that there was no reason to go out and look for except for this idea of aesthetics. Copernicus had that same idea. No real reason to go out and suddenly rearrange the solar system, but he did, except for it was simple. Einstein had this idea that acceleration must always sort of be the same, whether or not it's gravity or not. And from that, he was able to predict things we did not know. And so it's a very rare moment that science is able to go through and dream up something from pure thought alone. So it's a special moment in science. So this comes down to the question, and I've given this illustration of the development of gravity because it really is the catalyst behind the scientific method that we all use throughout society. And it comes down to what is reality? And I argue, and some people may disagree, that reality is a set of ideas which predict the observations we make. No more, no less. And it's ambiguous because our ideas change over time. But this is important because when I tell you what is reality, is Newton's laws, are Newton's laws reality? Well, that's what most of us understand gravity as. And if I go through and I throw a ball across this room, I'm not going to use general relativity to figure out what's going on. I'm going to use Newton's laws of gravity. And that's how I think about it. So reality is a relative thing. It's a thing that can change over time, and it can actually even change within the, you know, the circumstances you're thinking of things. If I'm thinking about gravity around a black hole, I don't really use Newton's laws anymore because they don't work. But in this room, they do work pretty well. Not perfectly. If you have your GPS and you don't use general relativity, well, it turns out you may be in Malaysia rather than in Singapore as far as it's concerned. So you need to use it to do the corrections. So even something like general relativity is useful. So why do we do science? Now, this is a question that people ask me all the time, especially ministers in the government. Why do we do science? And I always tell them, because it's interesting. Now, I've yet to have a minister look at me and say, well, that's not true. I think sometimes they think it, but they're never willing to actually say it. That's the beautiful thing of politicians there. Have it, find it very hard to always be honest and upfront with you. So it's because it's interesting. That's really why we do it. But the minister, after thinking about this for a second, will always say, okay, let me rephrase my question. Why do we pay for science? Ah, and that one I have a good answer for. And the reason we pay for science is because all of this philosophy about predicting things is valuable. It turns out it's very valuable and useful to be able to predict what happens in advance. 
And that's what science is all about. It's about being able to predict what's going to happen. And it turns out it allows you to make fabrics on the floor very efficiently, to construct chairs, to make watches. It allows you to manipulate the world and make our lives the way they are today. And if you think about everything around us, the vast, vast majority of it is humans using science to manipulate the world to make it more convenient for ourselves. And that's fundamentally why we do science. We all take it for granted, but it's there. And it goes right back to those days of Galileo and beyond thinking about gravity. All right, and science really has transformed our lives. I'm going to show you, I show you here the lifespan as best estimated for different times of humanity. And this is a good way of sort of figuring out what our lives are like. So if you go back to 30,000 years ago, the best guess they have is that humans lived on average about 32 years, which turns out to be a little longer than the Greeks. The Greeks were too busy killing each other with uh, the other Greeks, and so they had short lives, 28 years, but it was well documented. Romans, 30 years. Medieval Britain, 30 years. The average age of a human in 1910, 30 years, okay, 31 years. Since the 100 years where we really had the scientific revolution, the average human has gone up from 31 years to 67 years. That's the average across the entire 7 billion people. That's a remarkable change in just 100 years. And it is something that is almost entirely due to our understanding and advancements in science. And it's something that most of the world is actually sharing. Not everyone. There are a few countries where science has not permeated that do have very short lifespans. And of course, countries in conflict have issues in the short term. But it has a cost. And the cost is that for most of the ancient times, the world's population was steady at a very meager rate, which didn't, quite frankly, affect the Earth much. But since as we started developing technology and then science, not just technology, but science, uh, technology based around science, the number of people on planet Earth has started to exponentially grow. And those of us who know mathematics knows that anything that exponentially grows uh, something happens in the future if the universe or whatever is not infinite. That is, exponentials grow so quickly that they always break whatever is going on sometime in the relatively near-term future. So that is something we need to worry about. And of course, all those people, well, we're using energy because energy is one of the principal components that science uses and technology uses to manipulate the Earth and the universe. And that has consequences because that energy comes from somewhere. And in our case, it's coming from a variety of sources and it's leading us uh, as we manipulate the environment around us to things like deforestation. And it's causing, for example, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere to rise very rapidly over the last 50 years. So there are consequences to technology and indeed technology itself can be a double-edged sword. Everything that we do can be used for good purposes, it can be used for bad purposes, and it can be used in a way that seems good but may have some long-term negative consequences, and we need to be aware of those things. Technology can make life better, it can also create its own problems. And so for humanity's future, it's imperative, in my opinion, that we focus on using science and technology to not just solve our short-term problems, but to worry about our long-term problems. And quite frankly, science has not focused, and governments have not focused, and we have not focused on the problems 50 or 100 years from now. We have focused on the problems of now. And I'm going to argue that we're going to need to have a long-term focus if we're going to cope 
with what lies before us, some things we know about, and potentially some things we don't. So, science can help. It turns out that, as I showed you, we use a lot of energy, and there's a reason why we use energy. Energy is very useful. We can grow plants very efficiently with it, we can make things, we can manipulate our environment. And so, as the Earth, soon to have about 8 billion people, uh, it's going to need, for example, a lot of energy uh, and a lot of manipulation of our environment to grow the food and to live in a way which is sustainable. But it's not all bad because the energy sources we use today are convenient because they're stored reserves from what the Earth's done for millions of years, but there is a lot of energy sources out there. So the sun essentially has a thousand times more energy uh, than we use in a year. So if you can go through and harness solar energy with a reasonable efficiency, it's not uh, impossible to imagine powering not just the current needs of the world, but even more with solar energy. We also have the reserves of natural gas, oil, uranium, and coal up our sleeves to help. And we have other sorts of renewable fuel in the terms of, for example, wind and hydro and geothermal, which are also useful. So it is not hopeless, but it is going to be science and technology that allows us to harness these sources to allow us to run in a way that allows humanity to go into the distant future in a way where everyone has good lives. So science uh, can only be a bridge. It is a tool. It is not sufficient in itself to help us reach where we want to go. Science can only be the bridge because it provides a means of prosperity only if humanity is willing to share the technology and the affluence that each person on Earth wants for their own. One thing that I have seen is there's a very universal human trait, is that we are not very happy living next to someone who has a lot more stuff than we have. Some people are content, most are not. And so if we continue to move forward in a way where there are people who are much, much richer than others, the people who are not rich are going to want to be richer. And that will, one way or another, lead to conflict, as it normally does. I was describing to a reporter today who was, well, saying, I'm skeptical. And I said, well, you know, let's just take Singapore. People in Singapore pretty well off, and most people in Singapore are pretty well off. I bet you I could walk down with a thousand Singapore dollars taped to my forehead. I bet you no one's going to hurt me. No one's going to try to steal them from me. They're just going to stare at me and wonder who I am. But that's the nature, the nature of being in a place where everyone's reasonably well off. You feel safe, and it works well. And the world's going to have to be that way until we manage to get the vast majority of people up to a standard of living where they don't want to uh, you know, risk all to have what other people have. We're going to have a problem. Um, and while science is our best means to find solutions, in my opinion, it's a very logically consistent system, it is not guaranteed to find solutions to problems that we may create. There may not be a solution, or it may be that we cannot figure out the solution fast enough. So science is a great tool, but we need to give it as much help as we can. And I should say that science is already a bridge across humanity. And I was reflecting reading the Australian news that last week there was a a, a possible leak on the space station. The space station has a couple sides. It has the U.S. side, has the Russian side, and the problem seemed to be in the U.S. side. So what happened? Everyone on the U.S. side jumped onto the Russian side. They closed the hatch, and of course, they were figuring out how to make everything work. At the same time, we're discussing various things with Russia on Earth. 
where we're not nearly so civilized. Up there, they don't have a choice. They work together or they die. On ground, we probably don't have a choice either. We either work together or we die, but it's we die 100 years in the future, not in 15 minutes. And so that change of time changes the way we interact. And so we need to somehow get, and I don't have a solution for this, but I know we need to do it, we need to realize that problems 100 years in the future need to be solved just like problems 15 minutes in the future, where it's very obvious that we work together. And science is a way that we do this all the time. We work together on the International Space Station, but across science, even in the middle of the Cold War, people from all countries were able to get, to get together in science and discuss things. We discussed how the stars were formed with the Russian nuclear scientists and the American nuclear scientists. So it is a place where we have a culture of being open. And why do we do that? Because the goal of science is to learn. And to learn as quickly as possible. It's not to hold my information and not tell anyone about it. It's about sharing my knowledge. You get credit by sharing your knowledge in science, not by telling people, oh yeah, I've already done that, but sorry, I didn't tell anyone. Because no one believes you. Or if they do believe you, they think you're kind of an idiot for not telling people about it. It's not the culture based around science. And so it is a great culture to help break down the barriers between our cultures. It's a great place to share, but I am not naive enough to say that <coughs> everything is going to work via science, but it is a great way to start. All right, and we do it all the time. So for example, in Australia, about 22% of everyone who studies in Australia are foreign students. And we have people from around the world studying in Australia, and we don't do it for free. We actually, it's a bit of a money-making business, but it is a way to go through and to transfer the knowledge from people around the world. And if you look, maybe more interesting to me, is when you write a paper, a scientific publication in Australia, 45% of all the papers written in Australia are collaborations with people outside of Australia. Try to think of something else we do in a country where half the activity is foreign. It's very unusual. It's a very international activity, and you would find here in Singapore that your activity would probably be even more international than ours is in Australia. And what I really like is, who do we work with? Now, obviously, the US, the EU, and China are huge, so you're going to work a lot with them. But let's go through and divide through by the number of scientists in each country and look at who we're working with relative to the number of people to work with. And then, this is who Australia works with. New Zealand makes a lot of sense. Why? It's nearby, and it's culturally the most similar place to us. Singapore, I would say also nearby and also culturally very similar to us. But then things start getting interesting. South Africa, okay, not particularly nearby. Uh, United Kingdom, not a surprise, Iran. We preferentially work in Australia with Iran based on the number of scientists compared to European nations and the United States. Now that, to me, is a complete surprise. But it tells you the nature of science. It also tells you Iran doesn't have a lot of scientists. Uh, but the ones who are there, we work with. That is the beauty of science. And if you did this for Singapore, you would find the same type of thing. You work with people who you don't realize you do through science based on their size. So science can only be the bridge. And science can provide the means to prosperity, as I said, only if humanity is willing to share this technology, and I think this slide has gotten in there twice, so I'm going to move on. Uh, so what are our biggest challenges? Uh, well, is it health? Is it life expectancy? I would argue health, maybe. Life expectancy, most of us are already up to 67. So here in Singapore and Australia, we lived about 80. The average of the world is 67. We're getting pretty close to having all of us live 
similar lengths of time. But the quality of our lives around the world are vastly different. And so clearly health is an issue, but what, lo what allows us to live long lives and have quality lives? It's having access to good food and nutrition, water, energy, accommodation. It's being educated so we can be employed. We have stable and safe environments in the form of usually strong governments. So those are the types of things we need. And science can help on many of those things, but not all of them. But one of the things we can't deal with is having a, a world that instead of having 8 billion people has 20 billion people in it. Because that's so many people that I'm at the point of saying it's going to be very difficult for science to solve a world that has 20 billion or 30 billion. If we continue to exponentially grow, you know, exponentials are such that the 8 billion will turn into within 100 years 20 billion. And that won't be sustainable in any way, shape, or form. But there's an interesting feature that is almost universal around the world, which is as you get rich, your fertility rate drops. And so this is a diagram showing most of the countries of the world's fertility rate. So that's the number of children each woman has based on the GDP per capita. And the dotted line is sort of the replacement rate where you reach a steady growth where you have the same number of people. And already the world is almost at that level where we don't exponentially grow anymore. So we're close, but we're not there. So it's pretty clear we need to get lots of people here over here. Indeed, if you look at the projections of the world's economy, or sorry, the world's population, then you can see that if we, the dotted lines are what happens if you just keep on doing what we're business as usual right now. And that starts well, going well over 10 uh, billion people by 2050. That's going to cause problems. But if we can get people rich, and the faster we get them richer, then we level off quite conveniently. And so from my perspective, if we want to, if we can achieve a level of prosperity around the world there, everyone is moderately content where they are and are at that point where the fertility rate drops below 2.33, that will help stabilize the population of the earth. It will lower the drivers of conflict because it is people having very little versus people having a lot that often drives conflict. Most of the conflict you look in history is based on times when people felt they didn't have enough. And it will allow the entire world to focus on living sustainably through the advances in science. But you really do need to have that stability to go through and allow science to do its magic. Otherwise, conflict just destroys everything that you might want to achieve. If not, in our little part of the world, and the world around you, and that has a very good chance of spreading as uh, more and more of the world's involved. So humanity's uh, biggest challenges, we should not underestimate the effect of things that are already in the pipeline. Climate change is being one of it. For reasons I do not understand, people who come up and tell me they don't understand anything about science are more than happy to tell me why they actually are very expert on climate and there's not a problem. Okay? The vast amount of evidence is we do have a problem. And it's one that we're going to have to manage in the future. And we already need to manage it. It's going to affect changing wedding, weather, weather patterns are going to impact agriculture, especially in the developing world, and we're going to have to manage that. So for example, when weather patterns make crops fail in poor regions, we can just let them starve, but that will lead to conflict. Yet the total production of the world is, through these times, capable of supporting everyone in the world. So being able to figure out politically how to share the food of the world is going to be an important part of this. There's going to be water issues, especially in this part of the world, where the, gl the glacial runoff of the Himalayas is going to radically change over the next 100 years. And this is going to lead to, again, agricultural issues. For example, in the peninsulas around here, um, Mekong 
you know, delta is going to be different in the future. And so, again, we're going to have to figure out how to do this. It's going to cause effects in Europe and in North America. Rising sea levels are going to impact. You know, 100 years from now, sea level is liable to be upwards of a meter higher, which means places like Singapore are going to have to somehow either levy up or move up. And you can do that. But what about Burma? That's not going to be so easy. And again, if you don't do it, then you're going to have 50 million Burmese on your doorstep wanting to come to Singapore, and then that will cause conflict again. So it is a problem we need to all solve together. So these factors can be managed with technology, but they also have the potential to create conflict. So what are the prospects for humanity? Well, we have some challenges. And I don't want to gloss over and say, I think it's going to be a cakewalk. I think we have huge challenges. But what I note long term is that, you know, humans have been on planets, on the planet for about 100,000 years. The Earth has been around for 4.54 billion. And so our time on the planet is very short. If you think of the entire lifetime of the Earth being one day, humans have been on it for the last two seconds of that day. So we haven't been here for long. And I think sometimes we take for granted that we will always be here. We should not. Because there are challenges. And they are probably 100 years from now. And they may not affect any single person in this room substantially. But they will affect your children and your children's children and your children's children unless we deal with them now. And we need to deal with them gradually and get better and more sophisticated. But they cannot just be ignored long term. So what can we expect for the future? Well, I've told you about climate change, but there are other things that can happen. For example, the Earth likes to throw out a supervolcanic eruption every 5,000 years that will, doesn't warm the Earth up, it actually cools it down and causes crops to fail. Think of the world where suddenly we got one of these things and we had crops fail for a few years. Not just one place, but across the entire world. Is our current infrastructure able to handle that? Well, we could do that if we thought about it, but we would have to work collectively together. I'm not sure if we could handle this right now, and that's not un, un, you know, likely. I grew up in Montana. Turns out that Yellowstone National Park likes to do this about every 100,000 years. More close to home, Indonesia likes to do it about every 20,000 years as well. So it's not something that you can just say will never, ever happen. Now, I can't say it's going to happen tomorrow, but it's something we need to worry about. Longer term. The Earth does go naturally through warm and cold periods, things that would dramatically change life here on Earth for humans because all of our capital is invested in places where the weather is, you know, makes things useful right now. And those sort of have a 50,000-year time scale. We astronomers worry about things that happen every 50 million years. About every 50 million years, you're going to expect a rock about the size of, oh, downtown Singapore to hit the Earth. And that really will, if it hits, cause probably complete extinction of the human race. But the beautiful thing is we have the technology already in place to stop it from happening. We can keep this from happening. We can go through and figure out where rocks are going to extreme accuracy, centimeters. And we can go through and imagine deviating them very slowly. You don't do it all at once. You just push on them. So we have the capability of dealing with things like that. But you do need to think a bit about it, and good enough that some nations are actually worrying about this and charting where all these rocks are, making sure that it doesn't happen on their watch. And that's something we need to think about. There are some things that are going to be harder to deal with. The sun's nuclear reactor is getting more and more powerful over time. The sun is gradually heating up. In about 500 million, maybe 800 million years from now, the Earth is probably going to be about, you know, approaching 100 degrees centigrade. That's not going to be good for us. So there's not a lot we can do about that except we're moved to another planet. Mars will probably be pretty comfortable. It doesn't have much of an atmosphere, so we're going to have to figure out how to deal with that. But think how much time we have. Think how much we've done in the last 100 years. Think about how much time 500 million years is compared to the 100,000 that humanities already have. 
Science has the ability to go through and solve problems like this if you work collectively. That's what's so amazing about humanity, is we do have amazing abilities when we work collectively. The problem is, for every time we work collectively, we kind of work .999 times uh, the other way, and we just barely make progress due to our own self-destruction. Finally, Mars isn't going to be good enough long enough because five billion years from now, the sun is really going to change gear, swell up to become a red giant, eventually an asymptotic giant star, and will consume the Earth, or if not, the sun will just simply die. Now, let's think big. This is the galaxy. Our galaxy has got a hundred billion stars in it. It's about a hundred thousand light years across. And when we look out to a tiny little piece of the sky shown here, multiple, you know, which I'm going to zoom in using the Hubble Space Telescope, I see a sea, 20,000 galaxies, and that one tiny part of the sky, each with about a hundred billion stars in it. What is remarkable is that we, humans, have been able to figure our part in the universe despite being an insignificant little speck in it. All right? So people always say, are we alone? Well, I don't know. We haven't figured it out. But in the next 15 to 20 years, we're going to be able to start answering that question. We're going to be able to start answering the question, are there other forms of life out there? Because we're going to be able to look at the atmospheres of nearby planets. 20% of all the stars in the universe have planets. And the ones in these distant part of the universe, we can't see their individual planets. But in the ones in the nearby part around our galaxy, will. So maybe 5 billion years from now, humanity will somehow, in whatever evolved state we are in, be able to move to the nearest stars. But, let's think about that a little bit more. The nearest star in the sky, which you can see in Singapore, because being on the equator, you can see every star in the sky on those clear nights that you often have. The nearest star in the sky, Alpha Centauri, 4.3 light years. So, the problem is that's a long ways. So, at 300,000 kilometers per second, something that the Maserati that passed me on the way here doesn't quite achieve, uh, it takes a long time to get there, 4.3 years. However, if you go through and use something that we have, technology we have right now, it takes 26,000 years to get there with our fastest spacecraft we've yet lost. You know, we've let 26,000 years. Well, so clearly if we're going to go there, we're going to have to uh, come up with a way to have successive generations or, you know, deep, you know, freeze ourselves somehow so we can get there. But, that's actually quite interesting, because imagine we are able to travel interstellar. We would not go to Alpha Centauri, because we're pretty sure it doesn't have something that looks like a habitable planet around it. That's close enough where it's easier to see. But there are some nearby stars that do. So it's about that long to get there. But once you got there, it hasn't taken us very long to mess up Earth, right? We're able to use all the resources here pretty quickly. So pretty clear we'd be there 100 years. We would mess that planet up, and we're going to need to move again. We got the technology, so of course we would. Well, how long does it take to move across this, the whole galaxy? Well, it's roughly um, 100,000 light years across, and so it takes less time than you might think. It takes less than a billion years, even with our feeble technology of today, to go through and visit the entire galaxy, especially if you're exponentially going from star to star to star. And remarkably, as I said, 20 billion of those stars have habitable like planets in it. Now this led Enrico Fermi to think about our chances. So Enrico Fermi, very famous guy, helped develop uh, lots of the fundamental nuclear physics uh, that we use in various ways today. He reasoned the following, okay, universe, 13.8 billion years. Uh, and imagine any civilization has mastered interstellar travel in the 13.8 billion years before today. Then it turns out it only takes about a half a billion years to 
populate the entire galaxy at you know, the feeble rates we do, and probably we'd be going faster in the future. Uh, so it would have a chance to spread across the entire galaxy. Yet, at least myself, I have never met an alien, and my own view would be probably, despite a couple faculty members uh, in my department, probably no aliens ex have ever visited the Earth. I think the evidence is we've had no aliens here. So, the fact that we see no such civilization indicates that no such civilization in our galaxy, in the 20 billion stars that have habitable planets, has managed yet to master interstellar travel. This is known as Fermi's Paradox. So, we're positive. Maybe humanity will be the first. So, that's the big challenge for humanity long term. But what I love about ourselves is our ability to keep on inventing ourselves. And it may well be we are relatively unique in our galaxy. I'm confident there's life throughout the universe. How many civilizations like Earth are out there? That is an interesting question. And it may well be very, very few. All right. So science is integral to our future. And we know this deep in our cultural selves. Why? Well, I want you to think about our, how culture thinks about the future. And the best way we do this is through movies. These are movies about the future. The genre is known as science fiction. Think of a movie about the future that is not science fiction. I thought, I went through Wikipedia today, which has a list very conveniently of movies about the future. Every single one of them is science fiction. Science is integral to the future. We all know it deep in our hearts. That's the way we think about the future, is about how things are going to change. And so science remains integral to our future. Science can help us, but we, of course, need to help it. So what will be humanity's fate? We have the power through science to survive and thrive through most of what the universe can throw at us. But we also have the power to destroy ourselves, to not plan in the future, and to become prey to the random acts of Mother Nature. That is what humanity has before us. Our fate is largely in our hands, but not entirely. Because the universe is a funny place. And my discovery that the universe is accelerating tells us that the very distant fate of humanity is sealed. Because the universe is expanding. And it's expanding more and more quickly over time. Eventually, all of the universe we see today will be so far away that the light will no longer be able to reach us from those distant galaxies because space is being created between us and those galaxies faster than light can travel. Our own galaxy with its hundred billions of stars, well, those stars will start to die, our sun, five or six billion years from now. And eventually, the smallest stars in the Milky Way, several trillion years from now, will run out of energy. And we will have a galaxy full of dead, lifeless stars that my friend Charles likes to study. <clears throat> There's not going to be a lot happening. But it gets even worse than that. Because eventually we believe that even the atoms that make up those stars will begin to decay. And you will end up with the entire universe being separated subatomic particles with nothing around them except for empty space. And I'm afraid there's nothing humanity can do about that. So I will stop there on that cheerful note and realize that this is a dialogue. So I'm hoping I got you to think about some various issues in ways you wouldn't normally think about them. And now it's time to talk about it and for you to be able to tell me what you think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Smith. We have come to the question and answer session for this evening. 
May we invite Professor Balin to join Professor Schmidt to be seated on stage. If you have any questions for Professor Schmidt, please raise your hand and one of our staff will hand you a microphone. Please state your name and organization before proceeding with your question. Professor Balin, please. Thank you, Brian, for that uh, encouraging talk. Uh, and uh, uh, we do have some time for conversation, and so uh, perhaps uh, uh, somebody in the audience would like to start us off. Yes, sir. Uh, the, there are microphones circulating, so. All over our planet. If we go back in time, before uh, Isaac Newton, was it true that there were also uh, scientists, except that they were hidden from view from many, many years? And yet, they made discoveries that subsequently was discovered to have preceded Newton's important discoveries. I'm referring to the scientists from the Islamic world. People like al Hatam, Haytham, for instance. And uh, <clears throat> all these, what, what changed? Why science was uh, then in existence, and people were then in existence. Now, how come they were not uh, building bridges? Why were not? Why were they not collaborating big time? What changed since then? So, if you look back to various civilizations, so for example, you know the Mayans in uh, Central and South America had you know, quite elaborate astronomy knowledge through science. The Chinese were very good at predicting where things were much better than their Western counterparts. Uh, the whole notion of math as we know it was developed in the Arab world with lots of predictions, and those things all happened. But we didn't have very good communication back then. That's what it really comes down to. And so there was some technology, you know, the, the, the press being able to produce books, so an important thing is there were a hundred copies of uh, Copernicus's manuscript that Galileo could get a copy of it despite being separated in both time and space from Copernicus. And the, the tables from Greece had actually been sort of hand copied through the ages. So they weren't, they couldn't be widely dispersed. They were sort of handed down from monastery to monastery. So there was a lot of stuff that was lost. You know, when we go through and try to recover, in my field, records from China, uh, because they made the best astronomical observations 200 year, or 2,000 years ago, and we have things that blew up supernovae, and we want to understand what happened, we go to the Chinese records. They're the best. But I would say they were done in a way which is... Uh, uh, varied a fair bit on the, the time they were made and they're not quite how we would do it now. So they were all handwritten and there were only single copies of things done. So I think it really comes down to communication as being one of the great technological breakthroughs that has helped us uh, work better. And so, you know, one of the reasons why the Europeans didn't work very well with the, uh, the Islamic world uh, around 1100s because they were on the Crusades trying to kill each other and that once again comes to conflict being a big barrier to working and moving forward collectively. Yes, go ahead. Uh, should I stand up or? Uh, hello, Professor. So I'm Daniel from uh, Yale News. Um, so my question is, is science inherently, or do, it, can it be inherently neutral? Or is it something that perhaps leans towards a positive or even negative side? So I guess science, to my mind, is all about knowledge and truth. So... 
there are good and bad sides to knowledge and truth, and we see that, you know, uh, in, in every walk of life. So, to my mind, science is meant to be neutral. The problem, of course, is because things can be used for good or bad, there's always an ethical component, a moral component, uh, to how we use science. And that, because there's a whole range, there's billions of people out there, if, for example, I do science and I learn something, great, but then maybe that I could translate that to, you know, how to make a better nuclear bomb. Well, that's not really science. That, that, I mean, that's a technique. And so then you start, I think there starts becoming an ethical consideration. Uh, is it knowledge or is it a technology that will almost certainly be used for bad purposes? And so you have to make a decision. It's a gray area. So when I go through, for example, and I try to understand supernovae, those are nuclear bombs. They're just natural nuclear bombs. And it's not going to help, you know, Singapore become a, uh, an armed nation, for example. So I don't think there's a lot of ethical consideration. But one could imagine doing some research where it starts being very easily translated into things that can cause problems. And we see this, for example, in, uh, as I said, some technologies with respect to nuclear physics, but also in biotechnology. Uh, because there are ethical considerations in a lot of areas of biotechnology where you have to make a decision. Is, for example, putting onto the web how to create your own new version of smallpox. That's probably, it's, a, it's an interesting thing, but it's probably an ethical consideration. Says, maybe you should talk about the techniques that you use, but not talk about the specific recipe for doing that. Uh, I'm also from Yellen Yost College, uh, Redden. Uh, my name is, I think, in the climate change debate, um, one thing that's often said in Australia, where I'm from, um, is it's a debate, and there are sort of two sides to this. Um, but for many people who are in science and who are doing the research, say it's not really a debate at all. It's quite conclusive. Um, from your perspective, how do you think public policy and the way this debate is held should go, and what ways could it be improved? So. Everything in science is a debate at some level, but it needs to be made sure that the debate is between experts in the field. So I can have people come up, and someone may come up and say, the Big Bang doesn't happen here, and that's fine. You're entitled to your opinion. But if you're an astrophysicist and know all the laws of physics and all the evidence, and I can have a sensible argument with me, I'm happy to have that debate with you, even if I think you're wrong. But if you're just someone who says, oh, I don't believe in the laws of physics, then it's not a very constructive conversation, and I'm not going to have it with you. I still respect your, you know, your right to have a ill-informed opinion, but you know, it's, uh, it's not, I'm not going to waste my time. So climate change has a lot of that. We have a lot of people, and, and just to be clear, I'm not an expert on climate change, but what I, I think I have become an expert at is looking at the scientific debates made by the various people who have views on climate change of different levels. And we have to understand that there is a lot of uncertainty amongst you know, among the, the, the uh, science of climate change. And we need to have debates. And we need to be able to say, I think that's wrong. I think that's right. That's an important part of it. But we don't want politicians suddenly becoming expert in some area of science when they will literally in the next sentence say, oh, and, you know, I don't understand anything about science. But that climate change stuff is crap. And I, I'm always just stunned when I hear that. I'm like... Do you realize, you know, why that's inconsistent? And some of them don't, unfortunately. So what I've been advocating in Australia and the United States and Europe here is that we really do need to have a dialogue between scientists and politicians. And we have this. In Australia, the Academy has done a consensus document of our entire Academy using the experts to say what we know and what we think we don't know about climate change. And my argument to politicians is, why would you not use that as the basis of your thoughts of what we know right now? What, what, what possible reason would you not use that? Same deal in the United States, same deal in the UK. We all have documents like this. 
And I have yet to have a sensible answer to that. No one has been able to say, I mean, one person has essentially said, because you're corrupt. And I was like, okay, but you're happy to use your iPhone that uses the same science and technology behind it. Oh, well, that's fine. So, you know, it, it, we need to work on that. And ultimately, it comes down to you. You vote for people who run the country. And democracies get, you know, what they deserve. And so to the level that you're, uh, you know, that you vote for people, uh, you need to ensure the people running the country are sensible. And so I think there's a personal responsibility amongst those of us, you know, who are, are able to vote in democracies. Not everyone obviously gets the same, you know, gets to, to make those decisions in the same way. But it's a very important personal responsibility. And so trying to get the politicians to agree that there are areas where they have expertise is important. But in the same sense, science needs to realize that we are scientists. We are there to tell the unadulterated truth. It is not our job wearing our scientist hats to then say, as scientists then, we think you should do A, B, C, and D as the policy response. Because that's a political decision. And we can all have our opinions, but we should know we've moved out of science hat. And so I am very keen to keep the discussions of science and facts and probabilities here and the political discussions here and make it very clear that we don't mix those. And many of my colleagues believe in mixing those. And my own view is that that is a bad way to move forward because it essentially undermines your scientific reasoning. So you have to expect people to be able to take, you know, the information that you give them and not cherry pick and do all the things that they like to do. But you also have to be careful not to then suddenly weigh in and say, science says you need an emissions trading scheme. Science doesn't say you need an emissions trading scheme. It says if you do not do something about the carbon production, the following consequences are going to occur. If you abate carbon using a mechanism like a carbon trading scheme or something else, these are the effects. That's what science does, and they're different. And we have to be careful not to mix them, and not to do the other thing that science is sometimes, some people are prepared to do, which is to engage in hyperbole. I've had colleagues who I deeply respect on science say things which are not true to public audiences, which they know not to be true. They're hyperbole. And I'll say, why did you do that? They say, oh, well, because I've got to combat the bad people who are lying to them. And I said, but you've just lied to them too. Well, we don't want to do that. We have to be straight. That is the role of science. Yes, go ahead. Hi, I'm from the United World College of Southeast Asia. I just want to ask you, since politics have show, has shown such an unfortunate ability to stunt science when it's convenient for it, especially since it concerns itself with the short term. What kind of collaboration do you see for the future be between policymakers and scientists in general? So I think my own way of dealing with this issue of that, that ability for uh, politics not to, I would say, engage constructively with science and evidence, but rather to cherry pick is to get, first of all, to politicians who are genuinely there not to get elected, but to do the best thing for their country. Uh, and most of them start off that way. Few of them finish that way, unfortunately. That just is an observation. But so you try to get to them when they're first in. So one of my first things to do is when I meet, when politicians get elected, go visit them early uh, before they become jaded. Uh, the, the other thing is we need to have education. So here in Singapore, you're very lucky. You have a very highly educated, uh, uniformly educated uh, society who sort of does get science at a pretty deep level. 
And as a society, you all are capable of making choices in leaders of people who respect uh, the, the scientific debate and let it inform them rather than cherry picking and, and uh, misbehaving. My home country of where I was born, the United States, is in a very interesting situation where the science was, when I was a child, very highly respected in that country by the entire Congress, just a few outliers. And now that's been undermined. And the only way I know how to fix it is to convince the population to vote out the people who you know, are not sensible and do not have the ability to interact with the evidence well. And my concern is we're going to have to have a lot of catastrophic decisions made along the way uh, before it becomes clear. But little things tip the boat. In Australia in 2007, about 80 percent of the population was convinced climate change was occurring. Why? The entire country had been in a drought for six years. And then started raining. Very convenient for my vineyard, it turns out. But then people said, oh, okay, this climate change stuff isn't real. It started raining again. Except for the people in Perth, where the, you know, the drought continued. So if you kind of look across Australia, people in Perth still believe in climate change because it's, they're running out of water. And the people where they suddenly got rain, oh, it's not, it's not here anymore. So little things will sway opinion when people are ill-informed. In the United States, it was a godsend at some level that Sandy filled up New York you know, subway with water because that had never happened before. And that's something you expect from climate change. And it really hit home. People in New York believe in climate change. It would be nice to have something that affects everyone, that doesn't kill very many people, like that, to happen across the entire United States. Because people you know, see things and they believe it. What I worry is things will get more and more extreme and eventually 50 years people say, God, you know, this really is real. And they say, well, how do we change it? And like, 50 years ago we needed to start doing X. And I don't want us to wait for 50 years. But we'll see. Ultimately, people who are educated and understand science get it. So if I really want to fix the problem, it's education. Um, I'm quite excited to hear your talk before uh, today because I used to be the national team of China to the International Olympic of Astronomy. So, oh, yeah. Good. And, but now it seems strange because you're here in Singapore, I can, cannot choose my major in astronomy, so I changed to medical school. Well, it's a bit of fun, <laughs> I know. So, <laughs> yeah, and I, but in my study in the, in the healthcare section, I, I certainly find actually, I still need to worry about the future of the science and our human, human being because it seems that people are, can live longer and longer and because they're living longer and longer, so they are actually facing more disease than before, like cancer. We never, uh, people don't worry about cancers 200 years ago, ago because you, you, you won't live until that age, you're getting the cancer, right? So that means if we're living longer, actually we're facing more disease. We're causing more on the health care. Do you think that actually will cause uh, the decline of our civilizations? Like, because more, more old people, while we have less young people who uh, get born because you know actually the Singapore the fertility rate is the lowest in, in the world, right? I think other people were following the same path. And, and also, you know, actually, we, we see there are many innovations here, not in on IT or other stuff, but actually science actually, it seems uh, the most important part of science, like physics, already staged for like 100 years, I think, maybe, since Einstein, right? So do you think actually the science, the growth of the science, I mean the real science, will be slower than the problem facing up in the future of our, hu of our human, human being. So actually our civil civilization was facing a very big challenge in, uh, ahead. Uh, like you, you, you might heard about the theory of the, the big filter. That means the civilization will be filtered by a certain 
barrier of the technology or the or some uh, like supernova or volcano such things. So that means all the civilization will be too short that they won't have any chance to communicate with each other. So do you think we are actually approaching to that? We are just uh, walking blindly into that disaster. Like. So I think there are several questions there. Um, so let's, let's talk first about uh, the basis of what's interesting in science. So the 20th century was clearly a century of physics. Physics really revolutionized the world. And the 21st century certainly seems to be uh, going to be, you know, a biology era where we understand, uh, you know, the structure of, of life at a very detailed level. But what I predict is we will use physics to understand biology. <laughs> and biologists and physicists will overlap and we will use physical laws. Already I see this when I talk to a chemist and they'll say, oh, I'm a quantum chemist. And I'll say, well, what do you do? And they'll tell me. And I said, that's physics. And they say, no, no, it's, it's chemistry. I'm like, no, nah, it's physics. <laughs> and physics is not a bad thing. It's, it's just a useful tool. And so we will use these things. But if we're going to solve some of the, the problems, you know, if we're going to solve problems of, of energy sources, there might be a biology aspect to it, but it's probably going to have a lot of physics and chemistry as well. So I wouldn't say our days are done. It's just that we spend effort where at any given time we think the lowest hanging fruit are, is, and right now the lowest hanging fruit is in biology. There's just so many cool things you can do right now, and that's why we're putting so much effort there. So we're making people live longer. Now, a disaster, a true disaster for humanity would be somehow to, you know, figure out how to get humans to live hundreds of years rather than, you know, the 80 we live now. We are living a few years longer. That's fine. As long as it's a small perturbation, I think we're fine. But if we were suddenly to double human life expectancy, that would be a shock. That would, I think, cause some interesting issues I can't even contemplate. But it sounds like a good science fiction uh, movie uh, for the future. Uh, as we make people live longer, we're spending more and more of our money. So one of the big problems we have, as I highlighted, is inequity. But one of the great things about being rich and living longer is what rich people do is they spend all of their money in the last six months of their life to live a really crappy last six months of their life. This is a great way to do income redistribution, okay? Because every rich person does it, right? And it's hard to tax them. People don't like, for example, inheritance tax. But this health is a good way to, I think, essentially be a de facto inheritance tax where you give them the best health care you can and they live for, you know, to 99 and a half instead of 99. And, uh, everyone gets all their estate. So I think there are ways that we're going to deal with that. Uh, probably, you know, that gradual creeping forward. Uh, looking at civilization, you're absolutely right. When we, when we go through and we think about communicating with other civilizations, I note a couple things. We have been around for 100,000 years. That's two seconds to midnight of the entire life of the Earth. The Earth is only a third of the universe. So imagine there are a thousand civilizations, each that live a thousand years. Then what's the chances of any one of them being able to communicate with any other one? It's essentially zero. Even if we can shoot you know, uh, a radio beam across the galaxy, which we can't. The reality is we can probably communicate right now, if we really tried hard, with a sphere of you know, maybe 100 stars or so. And, but you have to exist at the same time. And what's the odds of that? Well, if humanity and civilizations live for billions of years, then it becomes pretty obvious. It's pretty easy. Uh, but thus far, we haven't seen any SETI. And so I think pretty obvious that uh, uh, civilizations are either rare or they don't live for really, really long times would be the best guess. But remember, we may be quite rare. There may only be a few. And we may be one of the most advanced civilization in the galaxy. We may not. I, I don't know. Uh, but it strikes me that uh, rather than just assuming we're doomed, you know, humans do best when they're positive. So my, my belief, 
Just like when I was telling people about getting a job, assume the best, prepare for the worst. And that's what humans need to do. You assume the best and you prepare for the worst. And I think that's the way humanity does the best uh, for itself into the future. Thank you. I think on that optimistic note, uh, uh, we should bring this conversation to a close. Perhaps we have, we'll, we'll have opportunities to talk to each other at the reception afterwards. Uh, I believe uh, there are some other uh, uh, announcements to be made. Thank you once again, Professor Schmidt, for the wonderful keynote speech, and Professor Balin for moderating the question and answer session. May we now invite NUS Provost Professor Tanang Chai pr to present a memento to Professor Schmidt as a token of our appreciation. Next, may we also invite Yale and U.S. College President Professor Pericles Lewis to present a token of appreciation to Professor Schmidt. invite Mr. Uwet Morowitz on stage to join Professor Schmidt, Professor Tan, Professor Lewis, and Professor Balin for a group photograph. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the event. Once again, we would like to express our gratitude to Professor Schmidt to, for delivering a most enlightening speech. We hope you'll enjoy the rest of your stay in Singapore. May we now invite Professor Schmidt to lead the way and take his departure, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to thank you for your presence and we bid you good night. <laughs>